Greetings and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you're sitting in the shadows, please show that subscribe button some love and make sure your notifications are set to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload a story. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or buy me a copy as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin, entitled, True Scary Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and a quick reminder, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listening discretion is highly advised. About eight years ago, I was in class at WVU in a building on downtown campus overlooking the river. It was probably around 8.39 a.m., a clear day with the sun beginning to rise. I was seated near the front, and the projector and fluorescent classroom lights were rather bright, so to give my eyes a little break, I turned to look out of the window. After a moment or two, an object appeared and slowly flew past the window. I was looking straight at it and watched it for about 15 seconds, as it passed the two sets of windows, and then, right out of my sight. It was a football-shaped brush metallic, the golden light of the sunrise reflected off of it, with no obvious wings, tails, propellers, or light. It made no sound that I could tell and appeared to be in a gradual descent. This was mid-lecture, and of course, no one else noticed. The professor was a bit serious, and I couldn't scream out, Oh my God, you guys, look at that, it's a UFO, in the middle of class. I was dying, though, that no one else had seen it because I wanted to go, What the hell was that? In my case, I never in a million years thought I'd even see a UFO. I had always leaned toward the feeling that People were making UFO stories up or that they were imagining things. I have no idea what it was I saw other than being 100% sure I saw it. I got such a good look at it that I was able to notice the details, all of them. But it was also nothing that looked like a drone I've ever seen. And it was definitely not an airplane. Hi everyone, I've been reading Reddit posts for a while, but never posted before. I've been hearing some weird stories from my daughter lately that have been reminding me of an experience I had when I was younger. I wanted to get you all's take on it. Bit of a backstory first. In 1994, when I was 11, I had an encounter with something that I can only describe as a shadow person. At the time, I had no idea what it was. Ghost? Alien? I had no clue. It started one April night when I was asleep, dreaming. In my dream, I was sitting on a wall, looking over the P.E. field of my school, when a kid that bullied me in real life came up to me, punching me in the chest, knocking me off the wall. I felt the full physical force of the blow, and it woke me up. I woke up screaming at him, my chest hurting from the punch. My physical body had been hit, and I had the wind knocked out of me. When I woke up, I had bolted upright in a sitting position, clutching my chest trying to breathe. As soon as I looked up across the room, I saw this thing. It looked like a shadowy, hooded monk, 
Where its face should be was just a darker shade of black. It seemed to be folding something in its hand, over and over again. I say folding, but it was like he was manipulating a liquid cloth. The fabric flowed back and forth in his hands, and was also black. A bright light shone from behind the creature. I remember being able to see my posters on the wall behind where it stood. There was no other light in my room, other than what was emanating from him. As soon as I saw it, I was paralyzed. I was trapped within my own body. I couldn't move, and now my chest hurt even more since I couldn't breathe. I didn't know how much time had passed with me in this state. After a while, I could feel my body begin to come back to me. At first, it was my toes. They began twitching. Then, my fingers and eyelids. And then, a rush of sensation came back to me. I was finally able to breathe and move around, and the creature was still standing there. I had no idea what to do. If I was to run out of the room, I would have to push past this thing, as he was very near the entrance to my room, and I did not want that thing touching me again. I tried talking to it, asking it who he was, what did he want, why did he hit me? I told him to leave. He would not respond. He kept looking down to what was folding in his hands and would look back up every so often, like he was making sure I was staying put. Something told me that somehow this thing had known that I was dreaming and that he had used the dream to attack me and wake me up or something like that. The longer he stood there, the more afraid I became. I tried pinching myself, closing and opening my eyes, and it was still there. I live in Los Angeles, and this was a few months after the Northridge earthquake. After having lived through that, I had this fear of being trapped in my room from a quake. So for a long while, I would store supplies near my bed, bottles of water, saltine crackers, and a flashlight. I kept the flashlight under my pillow. It's hard to describe, but it was like I heard this voice in my head trying to help me through this encounter. It reminded me about the flashlight, but told me to not let the creature see me get it. I had no idea what I was going to do with a flashlight against this thing, but it was all I had. So I pretended that I thought I was dreaming and that I was going back to bed. As I lay down, I could see the posture of the shadow creature change. It seemed to become antsy, paying more attention to me, but he could not stop folding the liquid cloth. I grabbed the flashlight and cracked open my eyes to make sure it was still there. It was. As I set up and turned the flashlight on to shine it at him, the voice told me to shine it where its heart would be, if it had a heart. As soon as the light hit it, the creature imploded into nothingness. I could see a spiral of darkness and light for a few seconds, and then it was gone. The next morning, I had a bruise on my chest where I had been hit. I never saw the shadow creature again. I'd have a couple more experiences in my life that I wondered if it was tied to it or could not be. I don't know. Fast forward to now 25 years later. I'm married with two beautiful children. My first child, my son, seemed to have a lot of a psychic twinkle. He has predicted a few things before they even happen and has shared a couple of dreams with me. He's been showing signs of this stuff since he was first learning to speak, but his little sister never really seemed to have the same sixth sense until now. A few months ago, my five-year-old daughter began to tell me about dreams she was having, about a shadow man. In her first dream, she dreamt that she had woken up to use the bathroom. When she finally was done using the toilet, she opened the door to the bathroom to leave and saw him on the other side of the door. The shadow man chased her, trying to grab her 
and ended up biting her on the finger. She's had a number of dreams about the shadow man chasing her over the past few months. She says that he has somehow turned her good dreams into bad dreams and is afraid of him. I have never told her or my son about my encounter with the shadow person. With story, she has told me about her shadow man. It was clear that she has only seen him when she's asleep and dreaming until today. She was at her preschool today having a snack. She was standing by a table where her snack and milk was, and she looked up out the entrance to her classroom. She saw the shadow man from her dreams outside the doorway to the classroom. It scared her so badly, she knocked over her milk box. She tried to point it out to her classmates, but no one else saw him. She says the shadow man ran away when he was told she could see him. I don't know what to do. My husband, even though he's a believer in paranormal possibilities, thinks she just has an overactive imagination. He's not saying she's lying, but thinks she shouldn't really see what she thinks she saw. The way she speaks to me about the shadow man and the details that she tells me about the dreams give me chills. It reminds so much of what I encountered as a kid. I don't want my daughter to be scared of this thing, and I don't want her having bad dreams about this thing anymore. But I don't think telling her something like it's not real is going to help. I also don't think telling her that I think it's real is going to help either. I remember my parents not believing me after my experience, and it hurt. They would tell me not to be silly or dramatic, even though I knew what had happened to me was real, and I was terrified of it. At least I was older when I had my experience. My daughter is only five. I also don't know for sure if this is anything paranormal at all. It could very well be that she is having a reoccurring nightmare inspired by something she saw on TV. Whatever this is, I don't think she's being silly or dramatic, and I don't think she's lying. It's real to her. And if this is paranormal, what the hell is it? Is it the same thing that attacked me? Is it now going after my kid? Why? Or is it a completely different entity? If you're still listening, thank you. If you have any ideas or similar experiences, I'm open to hearing them. I worked in a residential care facility and for a number of years worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to speak with, but she could be intense. The sort of joking flirtation that often finds its way into high-pressure environments was common throughout the whole team, but she directed it at me. It didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize that because I usually don't notice someone flirting with me until someone else points it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally caught a clue. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around all my shift hours after hers had finished, Unwanting, touching, etc. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible. Stopped answering calls and texts. Locked down social media. Spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but... Looking back, it was all kinds of fucked up. 
She even parked outside of my house sometimes, and I'd be sitting in the back room with the light off, so she'd think I wasn't there. Honestly, 2018 me is looking back at 2016 me, throwing popcorn and screaming, do something else, you stupid bitch. But hey, 2016 me was alarmingly chill. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed off. I was pleased. We all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Uh, no. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attentions on another co-worker. Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friend, but didn't know each other very well. I didn't think much of it beyond good luck, you poor fucker. I know, bad 2016 me needs to just settle down. A few months later, again, and I get a call, out of the blue, from the mutual friend, Linda, and I share. Without preamble, he asks, were you dating Kajiri? Um, no. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri, and helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda, and she asked about my relationship with Kajiri. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual, sensible, grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda, posting as Linda. In a string of emails, Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem, her abusive and dangerous ex, none other than yours truly. Linda coming out to her family after her brother called her in bed with Kajiri and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband, who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend, which puzzled poor straight single Linda. Some highlights of the stories Kajiri had been retelling to Linda, her friends, and other co-workers. I wasn't close to, she picked her audience very carefully, that Linda and I had physically fought, after work, over Kajiri. That two male co-workers, Kajiri and I, had an orgy in the staff room one night. That Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker. Note, one of the orgies ones I was really getting around, apparently. That I would drug her against her will. That we had planned to have children using a sperm donor, but that I would had a miscarriage. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera and using her co-workers and friends as set pieces. Linda and I reported her to management, and she was immediately suspended, pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I had an orgy at work. Because that was totally plausible and not at all made up by a crazy woman. I left that job a month later myself, and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half an hour before me, and they were looking to hire two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been other... <sighs> she didn't get the job, but there have been two other openings since, and she applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she had a history of inpatient psych treatment of delusional behavior and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Fossey, her current girlfriend, real, not real, me, who the hell knows, has a similar first name as mine and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live, though. I still have some of the catfish emails. If anyone wanted to read them, the crazy ones for themselves.
This happened literally a month ago, back in February, when my boyfriend and I decided to try out an open relationship for a little while, for various reasons. We live, separately, in one of the larger cities in the north of Middle America, and there's a decently sized population of college students, like me, to keep the gay community fresh, so I was doing pretty well for myself. One night, I was bored and scrolling through Grinder, looking for an easy hookup, when I got a message from a guy who was barely 800 feet away. He wasn't terrible looking, and I was a little desperate, so I agreed to go to his place. He lives, quite literally, down the street from me. I can see his building from my window, so I walked over. And he let me up and into his apartment. We made small talk and I mentioned where I lived. Hell, I even pointed out my window from one of the windows in the stairwell. From the first, I thought there was something off about the guy. Not necessarily bad, just different. An odd twitch in his hands when he gripped the banister. The vacancy of his eyes when he smiled. I'm not so cliche as to say he felt evil or anything of the sorts, but I wasn't exactly surprised that, after we got to his apartment, the first thing he did was to tell his very pretty late and friendly cat to say hello, and the second thing he did was walk over to the kitchen counter, grabbed a needle, and shot up. I hadn't even closed the door behind me. I stood there, staring, and he turned around, dropped the needle on the counter, and went, Oh, shit, man. Should have asked, are you cool with that? I'm not a good Christian boy. I have broken into a church while tripping on LSD. I had sex on the headstone back in high school. But I have made my standards, so I shook my head mutely, hold my hat back on, and open the door to leave. The guy rushed over and put a hand on my shoulder. Yo, man, I'm sorry. You don't gotta go. We don't even have to fuck. Do you want to watch Transformers 3 with me or something? Nope, I said bluntly, hustling away down the stairs. I bundled up my scarf against the early February chill and hurried back down the street to my apartment. He followed me downstairs, barefoot, in pajama pants and a t-shirt, until I stepped outside into the whipping winds. I turned back briefly to look after a moment, and he was still standing there in the doorway, watching me. I didn't have any premonitions of doom or weirdness. I grew up in Missouri. Junkies barely register as odd to me by this point. So I went home and went to bed. Now, you might have guessed it, but I'd never seen this dude around the neighborhood either. Truthfully, I hadn't seen most of the neighbors because my neighborhood is an odd mixture of white-collar suburbia, college housing, and low-income housing, like my Paramus building, all on one street. So it didn't really register when I started seeing him more. I would leave for work in the afternoon, and he'd be right on the other avenue, crossing from my building, strolling along. Or he'd cut across the building's parking lot. A lot, like all the kids in the neighborhood did. A couple of times, I saw him walking across the campus mall. My apartment building is directly adjacent to my campus. But he'd always swerve to avoid me. Once or twice, I noticed him in the grocery store I work at as a barista, but it's the only one within walking distance, and he mentioned he didn't have a car. This went on for the entire month of February. Eventually, I started noticing he'd always be walking down the street opposite from my building when I left for work at my usual time, and he was only ever at the store when I was working. He'd never approach the coffee stand when the store, where I worked, but he'd look at me. A couple of times I noticed him enter, 
look at me, pretend to shop, and leave without buying one damn thing. I was starting to feel creeped out, but he hadn't done anything yet, to me, to feel particularly unsafe. One day, late February, I worked an early shift. When I got off, I literally felt a little crazy from lack of sleep, and I reached my place about 20 minutes before I usually leave for work. And on the corner of the sidewalk opposite me was the dude. He was checking his watch over and over and looking up. I had a bit of a brilliant deductive analysis and followed his gaze up to my living room window. Then I looked back down at him. He looked right at me. There was a moment of tension as we stared each other in the eyes. Like I said, this dude didn't give off any evil or dark vibes. I've met people that do. No, what I saw in this guy's eyes, in his face, was much more human and much scarier. Depression, loneliness, pain, and anger. He hurried after me, but I'm six foot three and a former sprinter. Whereas he was a five foot eight junkie wearing flip flops on ice. I made it to the first set of doors to my apartment, scanned myself in through the second, and locked them behind me. He walked through the unlocked first set, trying to open the second, tried pushing the handicap button to open them, and then gave up. Look, man, I'm sorry, he shouted, laying a hand on the glass of the door. Can we talk about it? I shook my head. Absolutely not. Leave me alone. Then I whirled on my heel and stomped over to the elevator. When I turned back, he was gone out into the snow. I didn't see him for a, a couple of weeks afterwards, which is nice because my boyfriend likes to walk down the street past the dude's apartment when he stays over and needs to go smoke. One night, my boyfriend was over at my place. He'd just gone out to smoke before we went to bed, and he mentioned that he wanted me to come with him the next time he went out. Why? I asked, pulling him in close to me while we shivered. Um, it's dark and cold, and I get paranoid out there sometimes. He mumbled into my chest. There's this creepy dude that sometimes stands on the corner across the way and just stares at the building. One time he asked me for a cigarette and I told him I didn't have but this one when I had one literally in my hands. He laughed, kissed my chin, and passed out. I laid there awake, troubled, when I was sure my boyfriend was deeply asleep, meaning after about five minutes had passed, I extricated myself and went to the window. It was a cold, cleared night. I could see, across from the street, under the orange glow of the street light, was the guy. I couldn't make him out clearly, but when he saw me, he waved. I flipped him the bird and closed the blinds. I didn't feel like I should tell my boyfriend because he was either going to immediately go to the police which I hate doing, or he'd try and defend me. And while I love him with my entire heart, I don't want to watch a fight between a junkie stalker and my underweight, nicotine-addicted boyfriend. So I kept it to myself, and still haven't told him. But I did start accompanying him whenever he went outside to smoke. The guy was usually outside, Sometimes he'd follow us for a bit, before ducking away down a side street. Sometimes he'd watch from a distance. Sometimes he'd be up in his apartment. My boyfriend never noticed. I kept my composure, and nothing happened. One night, though, we went out so my boyfriend could smoke, like normal. When we'd reached the end of the street and turned around... The stalker was right behind us, about 50 feet back. I turned my head to check, and there he was. 
He waved at me again, and something told me I had to get back inside. Hey, babe, I said quietly to my boyfriend. Let's get back inside, yeah? I'm cold. Oh, baby, he said, kissing me on the cheek. Okay, I'm almost done anyway. We walked back to the apartment building, and without turning, I knew that the stalker was behind us the entire time. I kept my hand intertwined with my boyfriend's, and kept up the casual conversation we'd been having about how I hate geese. We got back up to the apartment, and he got changed for bed, while I grabbed some water. So, I've never lived in an apartment before, and I don't know if it's odd or not, but this building has a wire telephone in each unit that rings when someone wants let in. Ours never rings unless it's Uber Eats, so my boyfriend was surprised when it started ringing late at night when neither of us had ordered anything. Eh, it's probably just some asshole playing a prank, I said, unhooking the phone from the wall and putting it in a kitchen cabinet. He accepted that without a struggle, and we laid in bed. After he was soundly out, I got up, I got dressed, I grabbed a couple things, and headed downstairs in my thick winter coat. Sure enough... My fanboy was right there, in the parking lot. He waved at me and jogged over, smirking broadly. Hey, man. What do you want? I said flatly. Look, man, I feel like we ended things awkwardly last time, and I just wanted to talk to you, he said. So you stalked me, hmm? What? What? He started to look angrier, his brows furrying. No, man, I didn't stalk you. I kept... I just wanted to know that I could talk to you, but you always avoid me. Now you're walking around out here with that skinny little bitch boy trying to rub it in my face. And I don't fucking appreciate that. Look, man, he said, smiling again, stepping closer. You want to go talk about this back at my place? Ditch the old white boy and come hang out with me tonight, please? I won't shoot up or nothing this time. He took another step closer to me. I saw in his right hand a dully gleaming piece of metal, a folded up switchblade. He smiled at me and I sat back, shaking my head. His smile drained away into a deep scowl. Bitch, I'm done asking. You're going to come over to my place now and finish what we started, he growled. Unfolded the knife and pointed it at me. This dude was 5'8 tops and skinny. I'm 6'3 and 200 pounds and regularly lift weights. Also... I have a 12-inch kitchen knife, which I drew from my coat pocket and leveled out at his throat. He looked at my knife and then back at his and smiled again. Bro, <laughs> bro, I was just playing. We don't gotta... We could just talk right here, bro. I don't... Leave me and my boyfriend alone, I said very quietly. Or I will. Cut your fucking face off and eat it. What? What the fuck? I spent eight years in juvie for stabbing a kid in middle school. I lied. He backed up, putting his knife back into his pocket. I took another step closer, holding my knife level. He backed away, quickly, almost falling on the ice, until he was fully sprinting back to his place and I was chasing him down with my knife until he crossed the street and I stopped, slid the knife into my pocket, and watched him run back into his building. Then I went back up to my bedroom, told my boyfriend I just had to go pee and fell asleep. So, nameless, horny junkie, 
Let's not meet again. Or I'm serious. I will eat your face. Let me start this off by saying paranormal is normal for my family. So, ghosts, spirits, spooks, whatever you would like to call them, have never been a taboo subject for us. Growing up, you see something you tell someone, and everyone listens and gives advice. I grew up never being afraid of the paranormal and was taught to be respectful. My whole life, I had experienced paranormal activity, so it happens and I move on until my senior year of high school. Again, I was taught to respect the dead, so I had never gone ghost hunting or tried messing with the spirits, anything of the sort. If you do, that's fine. I was just taught not to do it. To each their own. Senior year, I was given an assignment to find ancestors in town and see how far back you can find your relatives. My grandmother told me and my cousin, a junior at the time, about an old cemetery that she believed a cousin was buried in and how to get there. So we get up and find her grave and get the information. We thanked her for following us to get her tombstone information and to rest in peace. The whole time we were there, my cousin and I felt very off, like we were being watched and not in a good way. As if there is a good way. I roll. Go home and everything is fine until I go to bed and have the same feeling I am laying in bed, but staring out my door into the hallway and feeling as if someone is watching me from there. This continues for months. I thought I was the only one who notices until my brother, who was 10 at the time, started asking me if he can sleep in my room with me because he is scared of the hallway. He told me he felt like someone was watching him from the hallway and felt bad. I agreed it was not a pleasant energy, like what a family member or maybe just a spirit passing through feels like. This was a dark, eerie feeling. Told him that he was fine, and we both laid in bed, stared at the hallway, and felt eyes on us. We both said the Lord's Prayer and went to bed. We are not a super religious family, but me and my brother felt at the time we needed to say prayer. I graduated high school and things calmed down. The feelings seemed to go away. Until that morning, my mom went to work and my brother went to school. I got up and I got in the shower and as I was washing my hair, when a heavy feeling crashed down on me and I felt I was being watched, I turned my head to look to the side and there on the side of the distorted glass shower door was a tall, dark figure. I could see head and shoulders, but no other features except the red eyes. I screamed and threw open the shower door, and it was gone quickly. Getting dressed, wrapping my shampooed hair in a towel, and leaving the house, going straight to my grandmother's, and told her, bawling, she looked as scared as I did. My grandmother believes it was a shadow person. Me and my mother had been fighting a lot as well, full-blown screaming matches, which we never did before the trip to the cemetery. Grandma called my name, and they called someone to cleanse our house. I never went back, and I moved out. My mom sold the house, and I still get horrible feelings when I drive by it. This is my worst paranormal encounter, but I have years of stories. I am currently 29, so there are a lot. If anyone wants more, I will gladly share them with you. I still have no idea who or what it was, but 
I'm terrified of that house now and when I live there. It took almost a year before I stopped having panic attacks in the shower. I had only told family and a few close friends about this experience. I hope no one else has to live through the hell I used to live in. Background. I forgot how old I was when this happened. Maybe like 19? Eh, it really doesn't matter. I've been friends with Jamie for a long time. So, this story is in conjunction with her mirror story. I'm Leah from the story she shared. Back when she shared it, she wasn't sure if I'd be comfortable enough to have my name in it or not. Hence the name change. Anyway, I was hanging out with Jamie, Brittany, and um, we're just going to call the other girl Muriel. We had spent the day together and decided to wrap it up with going to see a movie in theaters. Just as the movie was ending, Jamie got a call from her mom and the poor woman sounded extremely spooked. She said something was in her house, but that she and Jamie's sister didn't know what it was. She asked us all to come over, so we left the theater and rushed over to her home. When we got there, I could sense something was way off, and apparently I wasn't the only one because Jamie, Brittany, and Muriel unanimously agreed that they don't like the atmosphere in the house either. Jamie's mother told us that she and Jamie's sister, we'll call her Ariel, were just hanging out in the master bedroom and watching some television when suddenly the family dog, Sammy, started barking seemingly at nothing. They tried to calm him down, but he kept staring at the same spot on the wall where the bedroom door was and bathroom section connected. At first, they couldn't see anything, but as they watched, Sammy got out of their grip and ran over to the wall, still barking and now growling too. As he did, a shadow suddenly revealed itself and glided up the wall and into the bathroom where a curtain that had been secured down suddenly shot up with a bang following by a whirring sound, before going silent. That's when they hurried downstairs and her mom called us. They didn't want to be alone there, and we did not blame them. At a loss for what else to do, we all gathered in a circle and started praying. James's mom told us all not to open our eyes until we were all done. But I glanced up because I was curious, and to this day, ugh, I wish that I didn't. There, in the center of the living room where we were at, I saw a figure standing there. It was blacker than black, like a solid mass that the light couldn't pierce. It was staring right at me. Scared out of my wits, I immediately closed my eyes and started praying harder, and just like that, the air in the room cleared up. Like the heaviness had been sucked out of it and everyone, including myself, felt lighter. We thought that was the last of it, so we all went out to the front porch to talk and joke around to try to take the edge off the process. You know, everything was fine for a few minutes when out of nowhere, Sammy started barking like crazy and running down the driveway. I saw the same black figure sort of flying or floating or something down the driveway as Sammy tore after it. And then it just sort of shot up and disappeared. Sammy stopped barking as soon as it was gone and trotted it back over to us, tongue lolling, tail wagging, as if nothing had happened. I'm not sure what it was or what happened to it, but... To this day, the memory of that thing, whatever it was, 
lurks in the corner of my mind. I had an experience with a tall black shadow figure. I lived in a house that had three people killed inside the house. Inside the attic, the bodies were stuffed in. They were removed when found from the previous owner. I was about six years old and was laying in bed. I had a feeling of something watching me from the corner of my room towards the right. Well, I fell asleep. I was outside all day and was tired from playing. When I woke up, I don't know what time I woke up. I assume it was midnight due to how dark it was. I had a shivering fear that shook me to my core. I could not move an inch. I never had this feeling in my life and never had it again. When my eyesight came back to me in the dark, I saw a big figure. Uh, I assume seven feet in length, looming over me with a giant top hat. The first thing I did was scream for my mom and dad, but couldn't. It felt like my voice was broken. All I could do was cry, and I saw this creature, or supposed man, standing in front of me. The crazy part is that it just vanished into dark. There were no traces at all of someone else being there. When I was finally able to speak again, I screamed for my mom and dad. They came in and I explained to them what had happened. They chalked it up to just a nightmare and there is no way that someone was inside the house. And that wasn't until I reached 10 years later when I turned 16. At the time, we moved into a nice sizable house and had about 17 acres of land and was 5,000 square foot. Well, I was a gamer and would stay up all night back then. I stayed up all night playing some Minecraft with the bros. I got really tired, so I turned it off my PC and got a new change of clothes. As per usual, I went to bed. But this time, I felt something wrong in the pit of my chest. I just assumed I was just tired and nothing was wrong. But not long before I fell asleep, I heard something in the corner of my room whisper, along with a long, deep breathing. I could not move again. I didn't put the two together before it because it was so late. My eyes were darted towards the corner of the room. I saw yet again this figure, seven foot tall with a large top hat. I closed my eyes as tight as I could and was breathing heavily, really heavily, from what I had just seen. While my eyes were closed, I could feel a deep and heavy feeling weighted down on my chest. And as I prayed for whatever sinister being or shadow figure would leave me alone. It just poofed. That night, I was shaken. I stayed up until all night when the lights came on. I put some music on and tried to distract myself from what had happened. When the morning came, I told my dad. My parents divorced, so all I had was my dad. He told me he knew something was following me when I was little because I used to tell him I had a friend when I was little, and that he just didn't want to scare me. Whatever this thing was, it was no friend of mine. I experienced nightmares of this shadow figure, I assume, almost monthly. But ever since I moved, I have not experienced a single nightmare. I moved many times due to the divorce of my parents. I just thought I should share this experience. I've been scared to share this for a while, you know, due to people thinking I was crazy. This was my experience. I hope someone can find clarity 
knowing that they are not the only one that had this happen to them. And finally, they do not have to be afraid anymore. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support, for without you, there would not be a me or a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.